Venture Airways 15 is ready. Venture Airways 15, Roger. My name is Brian Greaves, I'm a pilot, I've been flying now for over 47 years and the last count I flew around about 40 different types of aircraft. I was chairman of the Aircraft Design Operation Committee for IFALPA, that's the International Federation of Airline Pilots Associations, and also a member of its Aerodrome and Ground Environment Committee, which actually looks after wildlife mitigation and control. What was that? When a bird strike occurs, let's just take a step back from that. What we should try and do is avoid that bird strike or wildlife strike. And we do that by looking at NOTAMs, looking to, uh, listening to the ATIS, and in any other way that we can get information. On the basis of that, we should think about delaying our takeoff, maybe asking for another runway, and perhaps in extreme circumstances even diverting. If a bird strike does occur, the important thing, as always, is to navigate, navigate and communicate. Once we know uh, the aircraft is under control, we can carry out a study of what is going on, analyse what the, the danger may be. Obviously, if we've had an engine failure, it's fairly obvious to us, but it may be more subtle and there may be damage to the aircraft which we can't see. This is where we can use air traffic control to give us information as maybe they've seen something or that a bird has been uh, picked up on the runway. And likewise, we can use our cabin crew to go back and check on the aircraft. Decision. Landing. Whatever happens, make sure you call air traffic control to get those remains or that DNA sent to the Australian Museum. So after a wildlife strike has occurred, uh, on the ground, the guys who are responsible for wildlife management, usually it's the safety officer, will go and do a runway inspection. They'll find out about the strike via the radio, um, either directly from the pilot or from the air traffic control. They'll go out, do the runway inspection and look for the carcass and materials. And this is really important because they can then identify the species involved and we can then develop management programs around whichever particular species is involved. If it's not found on the runway, in fact, runways might be closed in some circumstances because basically a carcass is treated like a piece of foreign object debris, a FOD, a piece of FOD. If they don't find anything on the runway itself, they'll look in the grass adjacent, looking to see if they can, maybe the bird or the bat has been blown off the runway itself. If they can collect the material, they will. If they can't find anything and it's an arriving aircraft, they'll go back to where the aircraft is being parked and talk with ground crew, with the pilot potentially, and see if they can find evidence on the aeroplane itself. And then the material can be processed for DNA analysis. So are wildlife strikes a threat? The easy answer is yes. The statistics clearly show that there is a rise now in the number of strikes. So in 2011, there were around 1,800 strikes across all the categories of aircraft, of which just under 1,000 were for high capacity RPT. Those are the types of aircraft that fly around, and particularly the B737s, the Boeing 737s, and the Airbus A320s. So if we look at the statistics, we have nine strikes against these aircraft in 10,000 movements. And if you think about it, that's basically one in a thousand. There will be a wildlife strike. The problem, if you like, or the issue is that we as pilots and also the operators don't perceive the threat in the same way as we would do adverse weather, such as a large thunderstorm or wind shear. But the statistics uh, speak for themselves. The, uh, since 1988, more than 230 people have lost their lives as a result of wildlife strikes. And the industry suffers, in the latest estimates, around $1.5 billion per annum in damage. 
So that's through delayed flights and physical damage to the aircraft and so on and so forth. So whilst it's true that adverse weather has accounted for more deaths, the fact is that wildlife hazards are a major hazard to aviation and should be dealt as such. People are often surprised that the Australian Museum works with groups like the aviation industry. Indeed, we're very well equipped to do so through the unique combination of our research, our collections, and the scientific expertise that we apply in work such as DNA identification of wildlife strike to aircraft. If samples aren't collected in appropriate fashion, we lose the capacity for accurate DNA identification. To assist with this, we provide free DNA sampling kits that provide all of the instructions for clean, safe DNA sampling for sending to the laboratory. First and foremost, personal safety is paramount. So all kits include a pair of gloves that should be worn whenever collecting a sample. These will also protect the sample from any possible human contamination. If moist blood or tissue remains, use the sterile swab to take a sample, concentrating it to a small area. Wiping a big area increases the risk of contamination from other factors such as insects, bacteria or dirt that may also be on the aircraft. Make sure you label the swab appropriately after use. If you have a larger section of remains to sample, you could use the gauze swab also included in the kit. These can then be placed into the clean Ziploc bags also provided in the kit and returned to the lab. For a dried blood sample or tissue remains, you can then use the alcohol swab that's supplied in the kit. Again, concentrating only on a small area for collection, you can then use the provided Ziploc bag to return that sample to us in the lab. If only feathers remain, place these into the provided Ziploc bag and return it to us. When handling the feathers, it's important to avoid touching the shaft of the feather because this is where the DNA that we will use is present. If you're removing feathers from a carcass to send for analysis, pluck the feathers, don't cut them. Alternatively, you can send the entire carcass into the museum and we will take that to our bird department where they will be able to provide a species identification. If you suspect multiple strikes, sample from each of the different locations, carefully record them, and then send them into the laboratory as separate samples to avoid cross-contamination. If you don't have any DNA kits left, or if you don't have one handy, then you may have access to a first aid kit. This contains gloves and other sterile materials such as cotton swabs or gauze, and these can be used to take your DNA sample and send it to the laboratory. Don't use water or other cleaning agents as these may cross-contaminate or damage the sample. Also included in the kit is an airstrike DNA processing request form. And while we understand that you have many record keeping obligations, it's essential you include as much information as possible so we can efficiently track and trace your sample. The minimum information we require is flight number or registration, strike date, strike time, and location of arrival and departure airport. If the strike occurred on takeoff, but was sampled after landing, knowing where the plane took off from can help us identify the species that might possibly be involved. We recommend the samples be sent to the laboratory for analysis straight away, but if this is not possible, put them in the fridge or the freezer prior to sending. This helps prevent DNA becoming contaminated with bacteria or mould. If the sample is urgent or for airports in regional areas, we recommend overnight post or courier. For samples coming from outside Australia, these should typically be couriered and extra documentation is required. So contact the laboratory ahead of time and we can provide you the necessary documentation and information. Once a sample arrives in the lab, it typically takes about two to three weeks to get a species identification result. We then send a results report to your nominated airport contact. For urgent or damaging strikes, let us know prior to sending your sample and we can typically get your results back in about a week. Over the last few years, we've compiled the results of hundreds of wildlife strike samples from a range of different species into our DNA database. This allows us to identify the most commonly struck birds and bats from a range of airports and locations from around Australia and abroad. The knowledge about what you're actually dealing with, which species is being struck is really important 
for helping manage the problem. So we do risk assessments. We collect as much information about the species that's being struck so that we can see trends, whether there's trends through seasons, through time of day, and we analyse exactly what the risk is posed by a particular species. We rank our species and we try to understand which are the high level risks, the moderate level risks and the low level risks. For the high and moderate risk species, we develop specific plans for each of those. And that might include, for instance, if it were Australian white ibis that we were high in the risk profile, we might have to adopt a program that's even outside the boundaries of the uh, airport itself and there might be nesting sites that need eggs and nests removed or, or some population management. If there's something attracting the particular species on the airport itself, it might be waterways or drains or the, the way in which the grass is being mown, then we can put specific plans around mitigating those risks on the airport itself as well. Understanding which species is causing the problem means that you can actually train the guys who are, are given the job of dispersing the birds specific ways to deal with that particular bird species. For instance, some birds will take off uh, when they're disturbed into the wind, other birds will take off downwind. And if you understand the differences, you can therefore push the birds away from the critical aircraft movement areas in a more disciplined and, and directed way. We cannot avoid strikes completely, but what we can do is to make sure that uh, we have as much information about the species as possible. A very important part of this is to make sure that we report the wildlife strikes that take place and to ensure that the remains of the bird or animal are sent to the Australian Museum for identification so that we can improve our knowledge. Applying that knowledge and our education and our training, we can learn to share the skies safely with the other creatures. Thank you.